Yeah, I've got My schedule this week is just brutal. I mean, I'm scheduled every hour today. Steve was asking me, and I said, ugh, don't even ask. Are you ready? Who are you trying to get? Oh, okay. You see, it's going to call in. Okay. Where's he at? Is he driving? They're going back for the results. Okay, thank you. We're trying to get everybody up to the to their chairs. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. We have um, Chris Coleman on the line, and um, it's time to go ahead and get started. So, city manager, I'll turn it over to you. Holly Olson. Good morning, and thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to come and provide you, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, an update on neighborhood finance. And um, so what we are is, um, for those of you who may not, not be sure, we are a not-for-profit mortgage bank. We were created in 1990, and to basically lessen the burden of the government on improving the housing stock and to increase the number of homeowner occupants in the city's neighborhoods. Our, the way that our lending program works, we are not a grant-only program. Um, we lend and people repay us. So the analogy that I give is the bicycle built for two, with us being the rag price straight, we know all about tandem bikes. So that first rider on that bicycle is what people borrow from us and repay to us. And the second rider is the forgivable loan, or the money that people do not have to repay that comes along with what they borrow. And this is really critical because, you know, again, people think sometimes because we're a nonprofit, we're a grant only program. That is not the case. There is no unicycle. They cannot get just a forgivable loan. Also, they cannot get just a loan that they would repay um, because then there'd be no difference between us and some other banks. And we do purchases, home improvements, and refinances as well. The, um, the, one, the main key to the program is we have three groups of community stakeholders, and all of them are represented here today. We have um, neighborhood associations that are on our board. We have local city and county governments that are on our board and are involved with us. And we also have financial institutions and businesses that, um, are, that invest in us and are represented on our board as well. They all have a strong role in the process. Um, we have made over $245 million of loans and grants since we were formed. We are probably gonna, going to hit $250 million or a quarter of a billion, I would say, by probably at this 
rate certainly by the end of the summer, possibly by the end of July. Now to put it in perspective, we kind of serve um, a demographic that might be different from what people think of a typical nonprofit. Um, in 2012, 52% of our customers had a household size of one. Um, many of our folks, I'd say probably about half, are purchasing a home, are home buyers, and the average income was close to $44,000, which is slightly above the 80% um, of area median income that would be served by, you know, typically many nonprofits, and they would have a cap at that 80%. Um, then close to another third of our customers in 2012 had a household size of two with the average income of about $66,000. Um, we address affordability by, um, as, a, as an example here you can see on the slide, this is using interest rates that were on the internet um, last week. Ours, our interest rate was about um, 3.358 um, and the loan payment with us was close to $503 and an FHA loan payment was a little bit more expensive at 531. Um, of course, with the FHA, folks would not have the forgivable loan. They would also have um, the additional payment of the private mortgage insurance. Now, kind of tapping into, you may have seen some of the visibility that the Polk County Housing Trust Fund is doing on the can I be your neighbor to kind of educate people on, you know, what are salaries and, you know, what does the person there in the grocery line next to you, you know, make and, and so on. Um, you know, the average salary of a Des Moines teacher, according to Indeed.com, is $44,000. So we're reaching kind of that working class demographic that um, is, is really critical to attract and retain in Des Moines. So it really results in great outcomes for everybody involved. Um, in 2012, we <clears throat> excuse me, um, produced $14.1 million of loans on 200 transactions. 44% of those customers were home buyers. Um, and the great thing for the city to know is that 48% of those customers move to Des Moines from somewhere outside of Des Moines. So 44% are buying into Des Moines. The remaining 56%, again, really great for the neighborhoods, are staying there. They are doing home improvements on their homes. They are getting refinances. We're seeing um, a very strong volume from the new neighborhoods that are coming into our program. Um, you know, we have some neighborhoods <clears throat> that are promoting us very well. Um, here we've got a, a slide that kind of shows some activity through the end of the first quarter and all of last year. I know Julian Hanover was a great promoter of neighborhood finance in the Merle Hay neighborhood. Um, Drake has promoted us very well too. Lower Beaver folks, Union Park, always been very stable. And Beaverdale has um, really been promoting us well and trying to educate their neighbors too. This gives you an idea of the dollars that kind of go along and correlate well with the number of transactions. So in terms of how our lending area is defined, um, neighborhoods come into our lending area one of two ways. One, they are um, getting some emphasis through the city's neighborhood revitalization program, such as with Douglas Acres, Grays Lake, Beaverdale, et cetera. Then um, the other way is for a census tract to be at or below 80% of area median income, because we realize that while many of those census tracts may have um, neighborhood residents, who have become recognized and possibly have become designated. There may be some additional housing stock needs and maybe those folks are unable to, you know, kind of get organized, but there still are housing needs. We noticed through um, doing some research um, that the um, two census tracts on the southeast side, these are southeast of um, Southeast 14th, they are south of the river and north of Watros. Um, 39.01 and 39.02 are going to be added to our area effective July 1st. Um, the main point is that the properties in these neighborhoods must have revitalization need, and that's a pretty extensive list of projects that are on. And Holly, yeah. which mm -hmm. neighborhood associations do those two census tracts fall in? It is um, Ewing Woods and I think Pioneer Woods okay. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so then in terms of how we leverage the money that we get from the city, um, on a purchase transaction, there's just over seven, about $7.34 of private money for every public dollar. Um, within that transaction, the city's portion is about $6,050. So that's being leveraged by the private money, the amortizing money of about 88,000 and change. Um, we get some nice leverage as well on the home improvements and um, nearly $9 of private money for every $1 of public money on refinances. In terms of um, additional money, then that we seek from public money. We do get money from NeighborWorks America. We apply to them each year. Um, we w and um, we've gotten over, at basically over $2 million since we've been a NeighborWorks <coughs> member since 2003. 
We also were successful with receiving a grant from the U.S. Department of Treasury for a million seventy-three thousand. Um, we apply. We have applied again for the coming year for that, and then we also seek grants from um, for specific properties on our real estate development program. So, in terms of you know how we make our money, we are basically set up for our operations to be self-funding through the fees that we got on our loan program in terms of servicing um, and then fees on the loans themselves and then interest prior to selling the loans. Um, then on, in terms of our lending, we um, did investment commitments from banks. I know we've got Bob Brody here from Wells Fargo and we also have Sue Radia here from Bankers Trust. Both banks very, very solid supporters of neighborhood finance since the very beginning. And we are very thankful and very appreciative of that. Um, we currently have an offering in the works where we have reached out to banks seeking $15 million in capital. And we also um, have secured $10 million from Fannie Mae this year. We are looking at getting an additional $5 to $10 million in commitments from them. And then in terms of um, money that we get from um, the city and the county, um, last year the city renewed its, its 2080 agreement, and we thank you for that. So um, that will be a $1 million of contributions through the year ending June 30, 2017. Um, the county's agreement expires on June 30th, um, and so then we're hopeful to renew for the coming year, um, <coughs> excuse me, for several years then to hopefully tie that deadline in with the city. And then as I mentioned, we have um, the Department of Treasury, but we are very appreciative of the money that we get from the city, certainly the money that we get from the county as well. Um, so then in terms of how we support the community because we realized that you know while we do the bricks and sticks it's important to keep property values stable that doesn't just make a neighborhood a neighborhood on its own so back in 2008 we were helpful with um, some of the buyouts um, then we also assist with some neighborhood funding events we're a major sponsor for the King Irving Jazz in July concert on Saturday <coughs> July 6 it's going to be an all-day affair from about 11 in the morning till 10 o'clock that night we're really excited about it as is the neighborhood association then to kind of also help other nonprofits, we do secure NeighborWorks America training slots, um, which are very high quality community development training opportunities. Um, we sent folks from various nonprofits um, out to those trainings and people have, have found them to be very beneficial. So then in terms of how we actually are managed, um, we have our audit done every year. We're a calendar year end. Um, our audit is um, presented to our board. Um, the audit folks actually come and talk with our board, as do the tax professionals um, that do our Form 990. We do monthly reconciliations. We are very careful on how we manage our funds. We make sure that the money that we get from the city and the county is used only for those intended purposes. The commitments that we get from the banks are only used to fund the loans. Um, so we're very careful about that kind of thing. Part of it really comes from, well, because it's good to be, you know, careful and diligent. Also, I have a CPA background um, with auditing, as does our VP of Finance and Admin. We, most rec we also get um, examined by the Iowa Division of Banking. And we had an exam back in um, August of 2012. And I'm very happy to say that they had no findings at all. So we are very, very pleased with that. Um, so then in terms of how um, residents and maybe some of your constituents would take advantage of neighborhood finance, how they could tap into this, um, the property must be in our lending area. Because we are bound by fair lending regulations and you know all of that, we, we can't make any exceptions. If somebody is three doors away from the boundary, I, I'm sorry, but they're, they're three doors away and, and you know that, that's, that, that's really it. Um, so the property must be in our area. We have an application, just as do other lending institutions. Um, if they're approved, then they can. Then the um, customer would seek bids on the improvement. And then um, the other thing that's critical is that after closing on the loan, the property improvement begins. We make sure that the, all the work is inspected, and then it's paid out to the contractors then. And then we also um, follow up with our borrowers, and um, we keep our delinquency typically out or below the national average. In terms of some things that we do in addition to lending, we also have our real estate development program where we buy houses, fix them up and sell them, or we may buy empty lots and build. Um, or if we get back a property, then we will um, rebuild it or renovate it responsibly and then sell it to a single um, homeowner occupant. What you have here on the screen, I won't provide the address out of fairness to the borrower, but this property was deeded back to us Originally, we were going to simply put a second floor on it. Then we realized the construction of the first floor wouldn't support a second floor. So we more or less dismantled the house and then built 
what was about 700 square feet is now approximately 1,200 square feet um, of this house. While we were working on this, we noticed an empty lot about five doors down. And this lot was owned by the county, so we bought it from them. We um, built an approximate 1,900 um, square foot home on here that has three finished bedrooms um, up, up on, the first, on the main floor and then um, two additional bedrooms um, down below. There was a family with five children that bought this home. They were very happy to have five bedrooms, so it was really a good thing for um, this particular street over on the east side. In terms of um, con some other um, things to think about, we have our, what I call to or what I refer to as our injection to the local economy. Um, our, the work that is done through our houses, we're not a do-it-yourself program. We're not a sweat equity program, which means that contractors are actually who are in the business are actually paid to do the work. Um, using the, typically contractors won't break out the material versus labor, so we use a rough estimate of one half. Since July of 2004, we've, through December, we've paid out approximately $6.2 million in labor. Now, I'm not going to quantify that in terms of jobs saved or created or whatever, but I can tell you that that does pay some nice, you know, labor hours, however you want to slice it, 10, 20, 30 more dollars per hour. Um, this is kind of a graph that shows, um, you know, how, how that, you know, where the breakdown is there, you know, a lot of work on the um, furnaces and so on, um, roofing, siding, um, you know, electrical people getting their windows up to, co you know, better windows, things like that. Um, I could, as those of you know, I could talk about neighborhood finance all day. I know you've got a full agenda. I will stop talking now and start taking questions. Questions for Holly? Skip. On your, <clears throat> on your page of leverage use of funds, mm -hmm. um, are these just examples and averages? Yes. Yes, those are averages so um, the, from the 2007 the, to 2012. Forgivable portion is based on their uh, income based on the AMI? Um, the, for the home improvement, the, our forgivable portion ranges from 25% to 50% of the project cost. And that is based on their household income and their household size. Okay. Um, typically on the purchase and refinance, um, if they have at least $10,000 worth of work to be done, then they probably would get the full 10000 allocated to rehabilitation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Holly? I might just add, we were at the um, partnership trip, uh, several of us were a week and a half or so ago, and uh, there was a housing panel, and we had a representative, one of the executives from NeighborWorks that spoke on behalf of, um, well, really NFC and mm -hmm. part of the housing panel. But um, NFC has such a great partnership with NeighborWorks, and NeighborWorks um, looks at NFC as being one of their model affiliates and um, there is a huge interest throughout the country, in particular here in the Midwest, to look at this model and how can other communities emulate it. And um, the city and all the stakeholders, the financial institutions, the neighborhood associations, they should be extremely proud of this because it is really the envy of the housing um, world out in the, not only here in Des Moines and the state, but within the country. So they've done a great job. Christine? Yes. Um, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I do have one question or quick comment if people can hear me. Yes, we Hall, can. Hall, you and I have talked uh, about some eligibility rules for the NFC programs and designated benefits several times uh, in Beaverdale, and that is um, a rule that the NFC board has adopted that. Uh, an applicant isn't qualified if they own other property. And I know, know there's been some talk of reconsidering that or, or uh, differently, but I know some people with property who would have been very users of the NFC uh, uh, that weren't able to do it because they had a small commercial building or owned part of duplex with their day for any situation. Can you respond to that? Sure, yes, I'd be happy to respond to that, Chris. Um, <clears throat> the reason why we have the one house rule, and, and it is one residential, pro people cannot own one residential property in Polk and the surrounding counties. We used to define it as the Des Moines metro area, but there's many different de perceived definitions of the Des Moines metro area among folks. Um, 
The reason why we've had that rule for um, a number of years is um, because we used to say that with investors they could only get the neighborhood finance transaction or neighborhood finance you know, money on their primary residence. And it's unfortunately um, the rule where a few kind of ruin it for everybody because we had um, a handful of folks that they, yes, they did get the loan on what was then their primary residence. Well then, their primary residence became another one of their properties because their fixed up property could command more rental income. And so then kind of, you know, switching around to, you know, various, to then, you know, there were various properties that became their primary residence. So because of that, we instituted the rule that um, people can only, they can only have the one residential property in Polk and the surrounding counties. Now, if they had, um, you know, simply a small commercial building where there was no residential portion of that, then, you know, we could certainly take a look at that. And that, that would be how they posed the question to neighborhood finance. If they said, well, I own property elsewhere, you know, am I, am I disallowed, you know, and, and they kind of made it sound like it was residential, then that would be a problem. But if it was strictly just, you know, a small commercial building like a storefront type thing, that would be another matter. But that's why we have the one house rule. Does that answer your question, Chris? I think he's on mute. Okay, very good. Um, anything else for Holly then? I just wanted to mention, if I could, uh, Christine, council members, the, the, the city injects a million dollars a year and has for, mm -hmm. for many years by, mm -hmm. by a 2080 agreement. The county puts in 800,000 hours. And I, I just want to applaud Holly and her staff. For the I think are, are really great. It's great to see a nonprofit that has stepped up and done so well with all the reviews they have to do. So congratulations on that point. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job, Holly. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, let's move on to um, our next presentation is from Bravo this morning, MD and Suku. Suku's going to do it. Thank you for having us this morning. I also want to congratulate Holly. I take full credit for everything she knows since I hired her many years ago to practice as a CPA. <laughs> she and I are both reformed CPAs. She just did a lot better than I did. Um, I'm Suku Radia, CEO and President of Bankers Trust and currently a member of the Executive Committee of Bravo and a past chair of the Bravo organization. Um, our purpose today is to merely give you an update that we feel obliged to do every year because we receive support from the city and the meaningful role uh, that the arts and the cultural and the heritage organizations play in this community is critical. And our region has been you know, bestowed with many accolades, so it all comes together extremely well. You know, when you think about best for families, best for young people, and one that's very near and dear to me, best for all people to grow old in, um, you know, truly, it's one of the strongest local economies in the country. And what, I, what we're going to do is to begin with a short two-minute video. And I've got two of my colleagues who will then speak after I'm done with my brief remarks. So, David. A picture. A story. One unforgettable moment. Art has the power to connect us. To teach us about ourselves. About life. About each other. Think about all the things you passed on your way to where you are right now. Maybe a playhouse full of aspiring actors or an amphitheater that hosts free music by local artists. A zoo, a historic building, a place where your kids learn how to paint and sculpt. Whatever roads you traveled, you passed an organization that wouldn't exist without the passion of Bravo. 
every single day, year after year, down the street from where you live, work, and play. Bravo supports the arts that make us stop and look, laugh and explore, taste and talk. You don't have to know the names of all the organizations Bravo supports to know our region wouldn't be the same without them. The arts aren't optional. Their impact is why Bravo works to bring the best to town, to cultivate the next nationally acclaimed artist, to help create a community too incredible to ignore. Art brings people together. It adds passion and color to our community. It's a way to express yourself. And to understand others. It makes everything beautiful. For every local patron and performer, today and for decades to come, Bravo. Ours is a collaborative regional model and we started in 2004 and of course the city of Des Moines is a charter member and with the 28 year agreements that we executed last year we now have the cities of Bondurant, Grimes and Waukee to round out so we have 16 communities and since 2004 uh, Bravo has continued to strengthen the arts, the cultural and the heritage communities and obviously with $18 million given to those since 2004. We feel that we've done it extremely well from a regional standpoint, made a meaningful difference in the community, but none of that, that would have been possible without the support of the city of Des Moines as the largest contributor and as a charter member. So for that, we absolutely thank you. I also would be remiss if I did not personally express my appreciation to Council Member Christine Hensley, who serves on the Executive Committee and this is truly a public-private partnership that works extremely well. And I just simply want to say thank you for your leadership. MD Isley serves as our executive director, so he's going to make a few comments. And then we have Jack Lasher from the Iowa Hall of Pride, one of the Bravo recipients, to give you a sense of what the Bravo do dollars does for his organization. So I thank you for your time. And after all three of us are done, we'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Suku. Council members, as Suku said, we're here to thank you and uh, provide you with a brief update. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be back once again in front of you folks and be able to uh, uh, tell a few good things that are happening uh, as a result of and as part of Bravo in the great city of Des Moines. Uh, we thank you folks for supporting the business of art. As you know, a healthy business economy needs a thriving arts community. The City of Des Moines and Bravo's 15 partner local area governments are able to provide funding of approximately $2.5 million a year to our region's organizations. We're able also to help generate awareness and understanding of the importance of a vibrant and healthy arts and cultural sector to this regional economy. Together we're strengthening our community and working towards making this a world-class region. In January 2013, Bravo released an economic impact study of 53 arts, culture, and heritage organizations. The study was conducted by economist David Swenson, Dr. David Swenson of Iowa State. As a follow-up to similar studies conducted in 2002 and 2007, the results of this analysis show the increasing impact of the arts and cultural sector on and with central Iowa. As you can see, the top highlights of this study show major increases across the board. Our key focus is actual regional economic impact of these organizations. Combined, these 53 organizations contributed $114 million annually to our local economy, an increase of 30% since, since 2007. An additional $57 million was generated in value add and $41 million in labor wages, supporting 2,144 employees across the sector. One of the many benefits of this economic, increased economic activity among the arts and culture sector is a corresponding tax revenue generation. Since 2007, the organizations have contributed 38% more in taxes at the state and local level. These taxes are a direct result of the work the organizations are doing and the workforce that they employ. In January, 
as part of Bravo's rollout of the 2012 Economic Impact Study, the Des Moines Register did a cover story, story excuse me, regarding the economic impact of the arts. With over 2,000 full-time employees employed by this sector, the arts in the greater Des Moines area employ more, more people combined than at the John Deere plant in Ankeny or Hy-Vee headquarters and all of the local Hy-Vee stores combined. What's clear is that the arts and cultural sector is growing, and with these increases, the sector is becoming a crucial aspect of our local economy. The arts are employing a creative workforce, spending money locally, and generating government revenue. We're a cornerstone of tourism and economic development. As Suku mentioned, we now have three additional partners bringing our total local area government partnership up to 16 with the addition of Bondurant, Grimes, and Waukee this past year. Des Moines organizations received the majority of Bravo grant support. Last year, 42 organizations based in Des Moines received $2.2 million in grant awards. Since Bravo's inception, more than $15 million has been awarded to Des Moines-based cultural organizations. Of the total award in FY13, Des Moines-based organizations received 88% of all available funds. Some of the largest cultural institutions in the regions, of course, are based in our capital city and are true proven economic drivers. Des Moines is the cultural center of our region. Together, the city of Des Moines and Bravo Greater Des Moines are good for business and good for the arts. And we sincerely thank each of you and this wonderful community for the support that you provide. If at any point in time you have any questions, concerns, comments, please contact me at any time or our associate director, Dave Stone. I'll now turn it over to Jack Lazier with the Iowa Hall of Pride. Hello, everybody. I'm Jack. Um, we have a long history with the Des Moines City Council. 17 years ago, we were going to build this Iowa Hall of Pride in Boone, Iowa. And um, because of a lot of things that happened, we ended up in the event center and, and uh, just great that we're there. After the first year that we were here, we had 187 field trips from around the state and zero from Des Moines. And so we talked to the Des Moines school system and said, what can we do to get kids and schools to come to the Hall of Pride. And um, they said the reason that they're not coming is because they can't pay for transportation. We needed one adult for every seven kids and, and they couldn't get, a, many of these schools couldn't get adults to come to work and, and take off a day and then pay the admission. And so because of Bravo funds, we have gone from zero uh, field trips to um, last year 187 field trips, 38 um, elementary schools, we have the middle schools, we even have high schools, and what they do when they come to the Hall of Pride is that they get a sense of what a great state Iowa is. They see interviews with outstanding Iowans, they see all of these activities at the high school level. We had a Brubaker Elementary School come, and we have a new agriculture exhibit with where you can ride in a combine and see a plant grow in 125 seconds, a corn plant, and we just said to them, Brubaker, fourth graders. What does agriculture mean to you? And not one person knew what, what agriculture meant. And so for them to go back there and ride in a, ca in a combine and to see a, a plant grow and to see kids from Iowa State that are talking about agricultural careers, that just is an amazing thing for, the, for these kids to, to see and they wouldn't do it. All of these kids, all of these kids, I don't believe would be able to come if it weren't for Bravo funds because they allow them to come to the Hall of Pride that with, at no cost. They, we pay for the transportation, we pay for all of the adult admissions. So it's been a wonderful, wonderful experience. And we couldn't do it without Bravo. We couldn't do it without you. And so I'm just thankful. And one of the ways that I think that always touches my heart is that we get, we ask these kids to write thank you notes after they have experienced this. And this one is from Monroe Elementary. And it says, Dear Bravo, thank you for paying the, for the trip to the Iowa Hall of Pride. It was really fun. I bet everyone enjoyed it. All of the fifth graders at Monroe Elementary had lots of fun that day, all because of you. There were games and people to learn about. I wish you could have come. If you had been there, I would have said thank you in person. I hope you still have some money left over for yourself. <laughs> OK, my time is up. Thanks, Bravo. And I thank you, City Council, and for Des Moines. You know, during the, state, the, the National Wrestling Tournament, we had 3,000 people come through the Hall of Pride in three days. 
And almost to a person, they couldn't believe what they saw, the interactives, the tributes, all of the things that we have in Des Moines, Iowa. And these were people from Ithaca, New York, and Stillwater, Oklahoma, and all over the United States. And what a great showcase. To a person, they were all saying, you know, this is a great place to have this national tournament. Everybody looks at you, everybody gives eye contact, gives directions. What a, what a great thing for us. And for the Hall of Pride to be a part of the Bravo family in, the, in Des Moines, it's an amazing thing. Thank you. Thank you. Are we Questions for? Any questions? I, I might just add that one of the important things that Bravo has done, um, we had two three-year contract, 28E agreements, and this last new 28E agreement is in perpetuity, um, which speaks volumes. So people have to opt out. It's no longer every three years renewing it because that took a, a huge amount of time. But that also speaks to the success and the effectiveness of Bravo. So um, thank you to everybody. And I know Suku and MD uh, did a ton of work working with all the communities to, to get that done. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next we're on to economic development. We've got three um, projects that we're going to learn more about. Good morning, Matt. Good morning. Good morning, Matt Anderson, uh, City Manager's Office. I have three projects I want to run by you. Most of them I think you're already aware of. Some uh, coming back to you for a second time on a couple of these, but um, you've got a couple a action items on your council agenda tonight on the first two, so I want to give you an opportunity to, to get a sneak peek at these and answer any questions you may have on my on the, the uh, Merle Hay item. Bill Lillis is here in the audience today if you have any questions. Bill and Frank Levy is here to address any, any uh, questions on the MLK and Ingersoll question, uh, project. Uh, Merle Hay Mall, you may have seen that uh, Merle Hay Mall has a, a, few, a number of things going on. Um, I'm going to run through a, a timeline of, of a busy year that the mall has planned from a tenant and retenanting standpoint, and then I'll, I'll get to the most exciting one, which is a, a new theater and uh, brew pub opening in, in, the, uh, in the mall. Um, early this summer, next month, MC Sports is going to be opening a new 25,000-square-foot uh, store that will replace the old Dunham store um, in the mall near the, near Coles, the Coles and Yonkers end. Um, as part of the major overhaul of the mall, the south parking deck will be demolished this, this, um, later this summer. That's the, that's the deck that's um, kind of back behind Target along, along Douglas. Um, in August, a number of the stores that are in an area of the mall called the Bridge Court, it's kind of that middle court of the mall where you have the opportunity when you're like walking toward Yonkers, you can either go down to a set of stores or up the bridge to another set of stores. That bridge court in the mall from a real estate standpoint, from a tenanting standpoint, it's always been a problem for the mall. It's kind of unique. You're, you're taking the pedestrians, the, the shoppers, and forcing them to, to miss half the stores. And that's always been a problem for foot traffic because if you choose to go up, you're never going to see this, the, the down stores and, and vice versa. So it's always been a struggle for tenanting, and I think they have a nice solution for, for, for dealing with that. Um, and Liz Holland, the owner of the mall, has been struggling with that bridge court for a number of years. Um, in September uh, is when construction will begin on a Flix brew house cinema and eatery and the Douglas Avenue streetscape. And we can, it's, we're, we're deeming it a streetscape. Um, and it's not necessarily the streetscape in the way we think of streetscapes as being out in the public right away, but it's that new facade treatment that the mall is going to get, a softening in that back edge of the mall. Malls today, new malls, don't really have a back door. Um, they're kind of uh, four-sided buildings. This mall has always kind of had this as a back door, and this is a chance to kind of make it more of a front door for the mall. Um, the, this project, um, the streetscape and the brew house of cinema will be done late spring, early summer of not 2024, but 2014. I'll typo there. Um, and, and then throughout, throughout next year, there will be ongoing interior renovations and tenant build outs as tenants are shifted around throughout the mall. And then a, a grand reopening of the mall will happen prior to Christmas. Um, the, the real figure point, uh, the focal point of this uh, rehab is a Flix brew house. It will be an eight screen dine in theater and brewery. You can go there just to eat or to grab a drink if you'd like and not attend a movie or vice versa or you can do both. You can 
also have the opportunity to have the, your food and beverage delivered into the theater with you. It'll be an upscale uh, uh, theater. The, the, um, the uh, opportunities to have you know, the, the bigger, softer chairs, almost like you're, you're uh, dining and eating at home an experience you can't get anywhere else in the metro. These are first run movies, they're not second run movies, so anything that you might want to go to Windsong or Century out at Jordan Creek, you can come to this facility, but you get a much better and different experience. Um, really what the, what, the, what the screens do, what the flicks does, is it allows the mall to have a second anchor. Anchors are key to mall survival, they're key to those inline stores, those smaller stores surviving. The anchors are what drive traffic at um, Target, Sears, Kohl's, and Yonkers being the, the anchors at, Mar at Merle Hay right now. This will add a, a fifth anchor to the store, essentially. Total project cost is $19 million. Um, this is really an ongoing um, uh, project for the mall. The first phase was the Merle Hay streetscape, that east facade, and bringing in a couple of junior anchors there. And what we're doing for from an economic development standpoint is taking that original phase one economic development assistance package and extending it by four years. It's the same package. Um, it's up to $400,000 per year of new tax increment generated in the, in the tax increment district and we're just going to tack on uh, an additional four years to help fund this project and the financial gap. Here's a, uh, an architect's rendering of what that new south Douglas Avenue elevation will look like. Right now, this is really, like I said, a back door with a couple kind of hidden back entrances and the parking garage really obscuring what's going on there. So breathing in a lot of new life into this area and creating another front door for the mall. And here's an interior shot of how you can see that upper level, particularly on the right-hand side. Um, you've got more of a, a sports bar and pub feel to it and then the screens, the, the theater will, will bring that on the perimeter. Moving on to, um, and I'll, I'll, I can pause for questions at the end, and I'll, I'll move on to Ingersoll Square Phase 3. Um, this has been before the council before. It was originally a lower density, one-story Viridian Credit Union that's proposed for the site, and this is, again is at the northeast corner of MLK and Ingersoll. Um, Newbury Development proposed a higher density, mixed-use property in the, in the round of CDBG DR funding that you reviewed earlier this year. That was not one of the top two projects selected for CDBG DR funding, although it did score very, very highly, and I think uh, there was consensus of the council that they wanted, um, directed us to, to find a way to see if we could continue to work with, with Frank Levy and Viridian to try to get this more dense project off the ground. Um, so we've been working with, um, with Newberry at your direction to uh, restructure this to see how it could proceed. And a financial gap has been, uh, been a financial package has been crafted um, to bring in additional developer equity, home funds, which were not part of the funding source before, and city assistance. Um, so what we have now before you is a, an eight and a half million dollar project. Uh, four stories, 47 residential units, 44 market, three affordable, and 5,500 square feet of commercial space. So keep in mind, in that previous one, none of, in the previous version that I'm going to show you a graphic of before, none of those residential units were there. It was, it was strictly just the commercial space. Um, one of the directions that came out of the CDBGDR uh, round of funding was that the city will be receiving $400,000 in land sale proceeds from the sale of city-owned land for the number one ch selected project, which was Tim Ritman, Jim County's project at East 4th and East Locust in the East Village. One of the things that we had pledged was that we would work with the other CDBG DR participants or, or, uh, to see if we could take those $400,000 and basically revolve them into another project. Now, we're still waiting on the state assistance to be approved, um, but this was our number one selected project in the city of Des Moines. And we, we want to take the, the 400000 assuming we get it, and, and be able to revolve it back into the Ingersoll Square project. This is at a 0% interest loan utilizing those proceeds. Um, Mary Niederbach has also, also been uh, working hard on this project with Rita Connor and Frank Levy to see if we could put some home funds into the project. And we have 300000 in home funds slated to go in to help fill the gap. 
and then a kind of a tail end uh, economic development <coughs> grant, 75% of the project generated TIF on just the residential portion, not on the commercial portion of the building in the, in the later years, in the out years uh, 11 through 20. Here was the original project, one story, really carried about two stories worth of height, but that second level was more of a, a false facade, uh, more of a, a very large parapet wall, if you will, so that was not really utilized space, but uh, a one story commercial building anchoring the corner. And then what we have now, and this is very similar to what you saw in the CDBG DR proposals, was a, uh, a much, a four story building, um, really go back and forth, really anchoring that corner better, putting a lot more mass on the corner. And that mass, that mass is in scale better to the two buildings to the north, the first phase, phases of that project, of this corner. So um, I great respect out of, to Frank Levy and Viridian for sticking, sticking with us on this. Um, would have been very easy for Viridian <clears throat> just to pull the plug and get moving with their credit union. So I thank them greatly for having the patience to stay with us. I know they want to see dirt you know, flying and get their, get their credit union in, in as fast as possible. But I think in the end, um, they saw this uh, as a much better solution for the city and the neighborhood. So I, I appreciate that. Um, some of the grand parking garage. Uh, I'm going to run through real quick. I actually just stole a slide from my previous presentation on the principal project just to bring everybody up to speed on what this project is. Um, engineering is estimated that by 2019 we'll need to tear down this ramp uh, from a structural standpoint. Um, principal approached us in January about their planned improvements for 711 High Street, which included a pretty significant change to the skywalk grade in this area which um, really the timing of that didn't work well with the 2019 <coughs> date on the parking garage. Um, at staff recommendation and council concurred that um, it would make sense to accelerate the demolition of this garage to match principal's timeline. Um, so we laid out a timeline that was to develop a scope and an RFP in 2013, um, select a developer by the end of 2014 and get the contracts all done through 14 and then construction and demolition in 1517 to match uh, principal's timeline. So we're going with a two-step process that we've recommended and I'm feeling really good about this process. It's going to be an RFQ, request for qualifications, followed up by an RFP. What the RFQ does, the RFQ allows us to narrow the field. We've had a lot of interest in this project. It's similar to if you were posting for a job, for an open, a job opening. You'd post, the, the, your, the, you'd post an ad first, bring in all the resumes, review the resumes and qualifications of the people. You wouldn't interview all 50 people that apply for a job. You'd, you'd look at their work history, you'd look at their education, see who best matches the job description, and then maybe bring in the top five or six of those 50 pool of applicants. We're doing the same thing here as what we're proposing. Let's bring in the resumes, review the resumes of those interested, and let's not waste the time of staff and the time of the developers if we just don't think they're a good fit for what we need to have done here. So that's what the RFQ is, is the purpose of it. Um, so we want to nail the, nail those, <clears throat> narrow the field to those with the most relevant experience, identify developers with a proven track record. This is a complicated financing and complicated urban construction project. We are looking for a developer and a team that's done projects similar to this. There might be great greenfield developers out there who really know their stuff and really know housing projects or retail projects. But if they haven't done projects in an urban core with a public-private partnership with uh, stakeholders like Principal and Ruan and the Marriott at the table, we need somebody that has the wherewithal and the track record to, uh, to address all of those stakeholders. Um, this will also provide us the opportunity to review references. We're going to be asking for both government references, public-private partnership references, whether it be other city managers, economic development directors, uh, maybe it's university partnerships. Um, we're going to want to be able to pick up the phone and call those people and say, hey, how is it working with developer ABC? Did they get the job done? How did, how did they overcome any hurdles? Any big project like this we know is going to have problems. How does, the, how does the developer overcome those problems? We want to hear a, a track record of success. And then at this stage of the process, like I said, it's essentially a resume review. This isn't a design competition, not at this stage. It's not a rate of return analysis or tenant selection, which tenant we like best. This is really bringing the, the highest caliber developer and development team to the table that we know can get us to the finish line. 
So our, our process now will be to distribute these approximately uh, June 1, Aaron Olson Douglas is working on this with me. We're finalizing some maps and graphics that are going to go into the package. We're also working with IT to develop a pretty simple project website where we can post the RF, RFQ, where we can also then go if, if, if during the course of while the RFQ is out there, if we get questions that come in from developers, we'll post the questions and the answers to those on the website so that all the responding developers have access to all the same information. And we'll, we'll post any additional graphics and information on that website also. Um, let me go back to the distribution. We, we're going distri to, we have a list of people who've already contacted us who are interested. They range from developers. You could probably guess who some of them are. Architects, attorneys, uh, general contractors, real estate brokers, people who've come in and sat down with us and talked to us about it, and people who've just cold called us and said, hey, I have a client who I think might be interested in this project. Get the RFQ to me when you're ready. Um, and then we'll basically go through our Rolodex of, of all those, those uh, entities that I just mentioned and, and shotgun out um, the, uh, a link to the RFQ. Um, the Community Development Department is also a member of ULI. We'll probably post a link to the uh, uh, kind of like buying a little ad in their website. A lot of develop, big national developers check, the, that's Urban Land Institute, a lot of developers check their postings regularly so that we can get it out to kind of uh, beyond our normal Des Moines and Midwest scope to see if we can, we can lure anybody who might be interested. And then we'll also utilize the DCA to help push this out to their, and, and Greater Des Moines Partnership, to push this out to their uh, network of, of developers and uh, related entities. So we have a staff team that will review these when they come in. It'll be on a, both an objective and subjective basis. We're not going to score these like we did the CDBG DR funding. It's, um, it's going to be the RFQ anyway. It's going to be a little bit less structured. We'll get a lot more structure when we get to the RFP process. Um, staff, we will make a recommendation uh, and present it to the city council for approval, approval. I don't know how many developers we're going to propose recommend to you at the RFQ stage. We're going to keep a number of them in, so if we get eight proposals that come in, our recommendation to you might be to continue forward to the next stage with three, four developers. Um, so usually when you go through these processes, a few rise to the top really quickly, a few fall out the bottom, and then there's kind of this middle set we got to decide where we'll put them in. But we'll, we'll address that when we come to it. Our staff team is, has done this a lot. It's, it's legal, community development, um, uh, Finance will be at the table. Economic development will be at the table. Um, it's going to be a. There's probably eight or ten of us that will be reviewing these from a, all wearing different hats. Um, we'll go through that RFP recommendation to the city. That developer recommendation to the city council for an RFP round. The RFP round will take place in late summer, early fall, and throughout the winter we'll be scoring those, working with those developers. That's where we get into the rate of return analysis. It's more of a design. Uh, uh, I don't know if competition is the right word, but it's more of a design competition at that point. And then we're starting to look at tenant mix. What types of tenants do they want? What do the, really those upper floors, what are they? Are they condominiums? Is it office? Is it hotel? Is it apartments? Um, really looking at the tenant mix and the actual projects. The RFP is where we start to really focus on the bricks and mortar and the dollars and cents of the project. The RFQ that we're going through now is really focusing on the developer, their team, their track record and resume. Okay, I know that was a lot to digest in a short amount of time. So any questions, again, you've got uh, Bill Illis with representing Merle Hayes here and Frank Levy representing Ingersoll Square is here also and I can answer any questions you may have. About uh, concerning Merle Hay, um, a significant western portion that basically uh, Coles, Yonkers, the food court and the outbuilding are in Urbandale. Uh -huh. Do we have an agreement with Urbandale on TIF? We do, we do not, and all of the improvements taking place in this phase are in the Des Moines side of it. That, that property line that you mentioned basically runs through the middle of that corridor as you're walking, down, walking north toward Coles. And so the, yeah, the food court, all that's over there. Everything that's, that I present and everything that's going forward is happening on the east portion in the Des Moines side of it. But no, there's no, there's no TIF agreement, no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But just, I think Urbandale does have a TIF district, so yeah. both cities have adopted basically a similar approach. Uh, William Lillis, uh, 317 6th Avenue. Yes, <coughs> Urbandale has a TIF district that actually goes out to Merle Hay, 
goes way out in Merle Hay to the interstate, comes back, jogs, and then goes into, I call it Old Urbandale. It's a modified type of a, t it's kind of a blend, to tell you the truth. It's an economic development incentive, but this has nothing to do with that, and uh, Merle Hay has no cross agreements other than the other buildings that uh, uh, they've shared some of the benefits with uh, Urbandale, but only on the Urbandale side. Other comments, questions? Uh, man, I had a question on the Viridian project. Yes. The $400,000, that is a loan. I thought that was going to be a grant. It's a loan. The developer asked us to structure that as a loan. It helps as part of his part of his financing, financing yeah. package overall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then lastly, this is the phase three. Could we just have a summary of all of the, um, the, the other two phases sure. for tonight? Just sure. so that we know what has been the, yeah. the complete economic impact on that yeah. um, parcel. We'll, we'll get that email to you later today. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. That concludes the um, presentations that we had scheduled this morning. We're now ready for public comment. Is there anybody that would like to make public comment? Joanne, I bet I know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> Actually, two things. Um, I want to thank NFC. This was a wonderful, wonderful project for the Merle Hay neighborhood. Um, as of yesterday, $15,770,056 that's been loaned in, in, the, Merle Hay? in Merle Hay. We're no longer eligible at end of December 31st, but if they had their application in, some of that has been coming in slowly. It's just beyond belief. So that, and we met with Mr. Lillis here on Friday. Mm -hmm. And everyone on the board who was there, that was five out of seven, <laughs> on a short notice meeting um, was in favor of the mall plans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, the workshop will adjourn the workshop, and we have council meetings starting this afternoon at 4.30. Thank you.